Hi, I'm here with April Kennedy, and she is the manager of CC Loaves. She is also an amazing artist uh, involved in many projects based around getting Worcester going. I um, was fortunate enough to sort of get recruited by her for this mural. I was in here back in the summer, and I was asking about the Montana products, and I was curious if they sold a lot, and I just started talking to the person working that day, which unfortunately wasn't April. It was, it was Yeah, it was Kayla. And she said that they sold really well, and then one thing, you know, one thing led to another in the conversation, and she mentioned that CC Lowe's was doing a... Is it Lowell's? Or it's CC Lowell. Am I, am I mispronouncing it? I didn't want to correct you. All right, well, I have a speech impediment. Let's just leave it at that. That's okay. <laughs> um, so... She told me about the mural. I contacted April, and uh, she already had Ben lined up for the project. And then we started we started going working on it right away. She had it planned for the, uh, the art on the art on the street of Worcester. And um, yeah, uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce her before I keep babbling on incessantly here. But, Hello. Um, I'm April Kennedy. I'm the manager at CC Lowell. Um, would you like me to just tell my... Yeah, just stuff? maybe go in, like, talk about your background in the arts, uh, what, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about your work, your inspiration, how um, you got involved with wanting to work more in Worcester, using the arts to, uh, you know, develop and cultivate the community a little more. Okay. Um... I mean, I've done art for my whole life. I grew up with my mother as my grandmother as an artist. They were major influences to me. Um, I don't have a degree, and sort of this job fell into my lap, and I've moved up the ranks slowly but surely. And, and you know, these projects are the most exciting part of my job. So this particular project has um, something to more promote CCC because we, we have kind of a tough location. So that's really where it began. It began with... Um, Kristen is buying or just recently purchased the store, and she wanted to expose herself as the new owner and expose the store a little more than we have had in the past. Um, and we talked about signage. We talked about, we were like, why would we waste our time and money doing, you know, a sign that just says CC Lowell Art Supplies when we could really promote ourselves with art and by contacting artists to do the actual work and to say, hey, we support the arts, we support our community, and we wanted to get it out there in that way rather than the traditional signage. Um, so it sort of just took off from there, you know, the two of us get going in these brainstorms and before we knew it, it was one wall, it was a corner of a wall, and then it was the side of Haiku, and then it was, you know, now we're working on the next building. Yep. So we're trying to spread it as far as we can go. Um, can you explain the process to me a little bit as far as um, how you uh, you approached the landlord? Um, I know you worked, uh, the subject matter was based on the fact that it was going to be on Haiku's uh, mm -hmm. wall. Um, I, if you can just go into the sort of schematics of that sure. a little bit, how that started. Well, it started with just the front of our store, which we actually flank the side of a, a very large block of buildings we're adjoined to. Um, so it had initially just been the front of our store because we thought that was all we were going to be allowed to do. Um, and when I presented the project to George, our landlord, he was so excited, so much more excited than we really anticipated. Um, and I kind of felt in, in in open up at that conversation and kind of spur of the moment I said, would you be open-minded to doing something a little bigger? Um, and he jumped on it and he was, as soon as he saw the work of you and Ben, when I showed your portfolios, he pretty much put full trust in my hands and that was really cool. Um, I didn't think that, I didn't think we were going to be able to take it as far as we were able to. Um, yeah, because it happened so it was it, so quick between you know when I first came in I right. I had like this severe head cold and yeah. I thought I was a crackhead. But, <laughs> no, you no. Know. Well, basically, like I said, it, it just sort of unfolded where it was this tiny little project and 
once you presented your artwork to me and I was able to check out your website, I was super inspired. And I was like, these are the guys, these are the people who are going to do this, and we can really go further and a lot bigger than I had thought. Um, and then once he had full trust in my abilities to run this project, then we were able to do the entire side of Haiku, which is over a thousand square feet of wall, which is a huge statement for both CC Lowell and for the art community. That's something we don't have in Worcester whatsoever. No, it's, it's definitely the biggest project I've worked on. And, um, I'm pretty... I was amazed at how quickly Ben did the background. And once I saw that he sort of threw that together in literally a couple of days, I was really right. relieved. I think that was sort of the joy for all of us on this project is that everything sort of unfolded pretty naturally. Uh, we discussed the initial plan, um, every, we got approval from the landlord, and then once we all sat down, we all had a connection on, on our idea. You guys played off of each other really well. Um, that was one fear. I think that's always a fear with working with artists is are they going to communicate well? Are they going to communicate the same idea and also communicate CC Lowell's idea in unison with Haiku's restaurant. You know, Haiku is nothing to do with CC Lowell, but it is on there while we wanted to incorporate the dragon as the theme and to represent that without offending anyone and while getting you two artists to work well together was my biggest hurdle and it was seamless. You know? Yeah, we were really fortunate. It went, um, we, we, considering how quickly it came together, I mean, I literally met with you the week before um, the street art festival and then we were you know, doing it soon after, and Ben, Ben put down the background, which was my biggest concern. And right. Once I saw him get that up, I, I pretty, I had a pretty good idea of where my uh, work would be getting right. done. So I wasn't really, there was no, there was no ego coming into it. I mean, it, it, I was just excited and happy to see that you know he he had gotten so much completed so early on because we definitely were. On a time constraint, considering considering this started, it starts in September, but you know it starts getting right. cold pretty quick. Right, but that that was the ease of this project, and you you guys really played off of each other well. You communicated well with me. We were all, I think, we all had the same level of, of excitement because none of us had done anything of this magnitude before. You know, I've never had to order 500 cans of spray paint for anything. I've never had to worry about how to cover that large of an area and make sure I have the right colors and the right quantity. Um, it's it's a lot more background logistics than you're used to dealing with. You know, I've dealt with small scale art projects of my own, but nothing on a public scale. So that was a really great learning experience for me. Um, and I think because of how successful we were and the the really overwhelming positive response we got from it, it's just inspired me to want to take this further um, and to do more with it. Can you tell me more about? Um, you said that. Montana donated over 500 cans. Can you can you go into how you approached them, how you got in touch with them, what their reaction has been to the process and that whole experience? Um, initially, I had discussed. We had sort of discussed, like I said, the smaller scale project with them, and they have a program that they develop with any any one of their retailers who would like to get sponsorship from the company because they do get so many requests for this sort of thing. Obviously, you you have your hands on spray paint, you want to cover the largest area you can and you want the biggest impact you can. So I think they get approached with this a lot. So they developed a program where dependent on your sales throughout the year, they, they'll allow you a certain amount of money to spend. You can spend it on whatever you want, whether it be Montana markers, cans, large cans, um, whether you want to use it for promotional ma materials or use it towards a mural or a public works project like this. Um, can you just, uh, for people that aren't familiar with Montana products, I mean, can you just give us a, l a quick background on how, on what they are, yeah. you know, the fact that they are geared more towards um, street, urban, fine art? Mm -hmm. um, um, Montana is a German company. And we, we're represented by our company, who we, is our main supplier for art supplies, called McPherson's in California. They're actually the ones who were really the liaison between us and Montana, because Montana's in Germany. Um, they developed this product, I'm, I want to say, 20 years ago. I could be wrong on that. Um, possibly longer. And it's just urban arts have, has taken such a, such a rush and yeah. sort of jumped up overnight. 
Um, and well, they, it's really in its. I, I consider it to be in this sort of like golden age absolutely. right now. Absolutely, it's in it's in the up and coming, and I think there's so much more to be done, um, especially since it's it's reached the major cities and now it's sort of trickling into places like Worcester and smaller smaller cities where it's really making an impact with people like us. Um, but their overall goal is to promote art, street art, they call it street art or urban art, um, rather than tagging and rather than fine art. You know, you can use this stuff on canvas, you can use it on whatever you like, but they really formulated it to work outdoors, to work in cold conditions, to be able to, you know, set your cans in the snow so if you're working at night, uh, you know, undercover, it won't freeze. You know, there are all these little things that they sort of developed to make it work for the street artist um, and initially for the underground street artist and it's sort of gone mainstream. Um, and become a part of everyday, you know, popular art, and now more citywide project projects that are sponsored by cities rather than this underground community. Mm -hmm. That um, that's what we're trying to do is is get more of a approved approach rather right. than going underground because we do understand the hurdles of that, but we don't want to quell it either. We don't mm -hmm. want to destroy that the beauty of having this underground sort of community and network, um, but we do want to do it in a way that the city will encourage it and embrace it. Too. Now, um, was it, didn't you have a contact at Montana that was just sort of staying? Uh, Lisa Slauson is the rep from McPherson, and she's the one who I was in touch with. She was extremely helpful. She um, provided me with all these other cities because this is fairly new to me. Um, urban art in general is fairly new to me. I have a friend who does it, and that's about the extent of my knowledge, other than you know what you see in pop culture and Banksy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but she basically sent me all these links for all these different projects that had developed in Chicago and all over the world and what they had done with it um, as sort of an inspiration launching pad for me. Um, and then she she basically explained how the funds program worked and when I explained the magnitude of this project and said, listen, I, I don't know that this hundred cans is going to do what we want it to do, she literally bent over backwards and somehow turned around exactly the colors I wanted, exactly the quantity I needed, and turned it around within a week and we had 500 cans of Well, they, they know it's a really smart business model right. too. They're putting in a sm you know relatively... In the scope of things, right. it's a small in investment, but it's a huge advertisement Absolutely. for their product. I mean, I would love to just have some. Uh, I, I I would be totally down with giving them some sort of credit absolutely. because I mean and they, they were such a huge credit. help. They they absolutely should, and I think they do understand how these projects. And the cool thing about in you know more of a business sense, the cool thing about urban art is it's a really fast moving um, product. It's it's a a really good selling product for them it's a really good selling product for us and we all know that you know the community art is ultimately what this is about but it also is a sales tactic on both ends oh yeah it's definitely beneficial to both of our businesses to have a big mural like this and to promote the, the beauty of this particular paint well one of the things that I noticed when we were working on it is uh, there was a lot of positive reaction from everyone overall but the thing that I really sort of uh, got a interesting experience out of was how many kids that it just inspired or made happy and one of the things about Worcester is that it, it tends to I, I think it, it needs to sort of embrace the Absolutely. younger generations and cultures earlier right because if people don't care about their city if they don't have any sort of identity to it they're not going to want to make it a better place exactly and i think that um you know worcester is one of those cities that struggled with tagging and it struggled with negative graffiti and in you know turf wars that sort of thing on a very small scale but with a very young bracket of kids you know there were a couple things in the paper over the last few years about tagging um and about you know it's really a matter of disrespect uh, um within your own community and i think that that's what we would like to do is sort of breach that and and sort of introduce graffiti art as a positive art form rather than yeah well that's that, that's something that you have to educate um, city planners and people working within the, the uh, that system you have to let them know when you go and you whitewash over graffiti you're giving them a completely mm -hmm. new canvas it's and a lot of people canvas. will respect like they will respect work, and they won't bomb it. They won't right. tag over it. So it's it's all about educating that sector of. And I do think that um, I, I'm sure that a lot of city planning organizations aren't aware that there really is sort of an unspoken rule within the graffiti and 
urban art community that you don't tag over somebody else's artwork. You can tag over tags, you can tag over, you know, miscellaneous writing, but there is sort of an unspoken law. I'm sure that it's not written anywhere, there's no code, but there, in, in every, every person I've talked to who buys paint from us, um, and in reaction specific to do, specifically to our mural, has said that, that you don't do that. It's just a respect issue. Mm -hmm. And I think most artists who, who embrace graffiti art as an art form rather than just a tag yeah. or, or just, you know, kind of saying their piece somewhere, um, I think that they do respect that code. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that, uh, you know, you and I have spoken about this uh, in depth and we definitely want to go further than this we don't want to stop at just doing one one piece because you know i i've i've talked to you, to you about this a lot in which you know i think we get one more large mm -hmm. piece under our belt and i'd love to do something that i would love i would like to maybe sort of push it a little more in mm -hmm. the direction of being maybe uh slightly stranger but equally beautiful a little bit more avant-garde yeah think, i think that we as a first first of all as sort of our advertisement for both the neighbors and ourselves we were a little bit um maybe a little bit more careful than we would yeah. be if this were somewhere else yeah um but because we've had such a positive response to it i think you know, we have to sort of ride that momentum and go with it um, because we do have positive feedback from, you know, I have, I've had 80-year-old women come in here and tell me how beautiful that is. And that's really uh, that's really inspiring to hear it from the older generation yep. because that's, I think, our fear is we don't, we don't want to give off the wrong impression or give the wrong idea about graffiti art in general. And to hear that from an 80-year-old woman, but then also hear it from, you know, a 10-year-old kid who just wants to learn how to do this and is so excited to to learn the art of this is, is really cool. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's I'm a big believer in you have to you have to create a love for the city that you're in. And if you don't, people aren't going to want to... Right make it better and uh, like one of the problems that tends to happen with any town west of 495 in Massachusetts is what Worcester's the second biggest city in Massachusetts right. but it's it's got this huge museum you know it it's got a, a giant population but it's got this you know it's also got this really high crime rate mm -hmm. and they just seemed like they can't we can't get out of our own way and i think that you know, it's been a joke. Everyone knows Worcester as a, sort of a joke, as the yeah. city the city that could or should, and it, it hasn't. And I think there are a few of us who are really strongly believe that Worcester has the potential to be something really amazing. Um, and I think that I've, I've watched a lot of young business owners sort of pop up here and there throughout the city, and they're really inspiring. And I think they have a, a very new approach to how, how to deal with the city and how to embrace all the different aspects of diversity that Worcester has, and I think we have to roll with it. I think you have to sort of accept that and and use it to your advantage rather than trying to to be something we're not. Yes, I mean that's why I'm I'm I think if we get a few more of these projects done, then we can start to uh, lure in and attract some you know other names in the uh, street art community mm -hmm. to sort of we want to put the net out there and let the world know and let the United States know and whatever you know any any we want anybody to know that hey we support these types of right. projects and we want you to come here because I know that once we reach out to that larger community it'll just put the word out right. about Worcester and that will that that helps everyone in the long run especially it especially uh, economically as well. Right. It just creates a lot of opportunities. Well, I think we've we've all seen, you know, the response from Start on the Street and the programs that um, Tina and her group have developed, the overwhelming response and the huge turnout for these And you said, you mean Tina's... Tina's Lodi. Um, who started. Who, star who is one of the co-founders of Start on the Street. Um, and that festival turned out, I think they said, over 50,000, 50,000 50, this yeah. year, which is huge for Worcester. And that's, you know, it just goes to show where... You know, the Cultural Coalition has been sort of fighting for the name, the Creative City for Worcester, and I think we, 
we really need to make it happen. You can't. You can only pass so many laws before you kind of limit yourself. I yeah. think it's time to just roll, just actually make some progress and yeah. actually do something and be the creative city that we're supposed to be. One of the things I've noticed where it happened, like I, I lived in Williamsburg, Brooklyn for 10 years, and I noticed that with different population densities, like Brooklyn just would have, like so many street artists came out of there that mm -hmm. just exploded. Like, you know, like, I don't know if you're familiar with Swoon's work. She does a lot of wheat pasting, these beautiful drawings that have a woodblock type quality mm -hmm. to them, like really well done. And mm -hmm. But the, the thing you would notice in Brooklyn, there's literally like a wheat paste or a new mural or some amazing graffiti every like mm -hmm. like block. It right. starts popping up. And that's, slight, that's what's slightly different here because of the population, the amount of artists working mm -hmm. here. That type of um, art diversity is not gonna pop up here but we also have a lot of other opportunities because the space there's is much we're an old mill, mill city i think that or not mills but you know we've got all these old abandoned buildings i think that we've got a lot of blank canvas to work with and i think it's a matter of getting over the hurdles of the city ordinances and um well the, i think once i mean of repercussion right, as well right well um, I'm, I'm pretty certain if it's private property i mean i i know an ord like i'm not trying to fight this law or argue with them but I, I think once we you know let them know what we're doing and I sort of put all of this information together it'll be seen as really I think positive. it needs this kind of cohesion to come through I think if you don't have you know a statement and and this conversation with this group of people then they they think it's coming from one person when we're not the only people having this discussion we're not the only people who, who feel that poster is lacking this sort of art so I think I think that'll uh, that'll wrap it up, but it's been amazing speaking with you and sort of going over our you know, some of our goals of what we want to do, and I always you know, enjoy sharing and getting feedback. So I know that this is just the start.